Morning, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. I was going to say it's great to see everybody. It's great to see those of you who are here. We're missing a lot of folks, but I guess I'm starting a little bit early, so maybe some, some folks will still be drifting in. But it is great to see everybody. If anybody is visiting with us, certainly want to... Uh, welcome you. I hope to maybe introduce myself uh, after the service and maybe get to know you a little bit. But do hope everyone will stick around after the service. Uh, just take some time to kind of uh, introduce yourself to folks or, or speak to somebody. Uh, don't underestimate the importance of our relationships with each other. Uh, we do have refreshments in the fellowship hall. We'd love to have join us for that or you'd linger here in the sanctuary. But I hope you will stick around for refreshments. And then we do have Sunday school classes uh, following refreshments. So hopefully you could uh, join us for that and enjoy that time of, of fellowship together. Uh, evening worship tonight at 6 o'clock, Brian Groot is going to be filling our pulpit. Brian, of course, is related to the Elwell family and, uh, from Faith Church nearby and a student at Westminster Seminary. Brian's ministry here is always appreciated, so we look forward to hearing from Brian tonight. I failed to mention in the, uh, in the email of the congregation yesterday that men's theological studies will be this week, uh, Wednesday night and uh, hopefully Thursday afternoon as well. Uh, we're actually wrapping up the confession, our studies in the confession this week, so it should be really interesting. We'll be talking about uh, the resurrection of the dead and the last judgment, so I would encourage guys if you've been part of this or even if you haven't been uh, men and young men are welcome to join us you'll want to read that last the last two chapters of the confession and the corresponding books in uh, the corresponding chapters in truths we confess by rc sproul come prepared to to to, to, to debate and discuss. Uh, this will be our last study in the confession and our last study for the year. Lord willing, uh, we're going to wait. In the new year, we'll begin a new study uh, for the men. I'll, I look forward to telling you more about that, but um, hopefully you guys can join us. If we have enough, if we have enough guys who aren't able to come on Wednesday night, but who'd like to come Thursday afternoon, we'll do that again. We try to do that each month if we have enough guys, but, but uh, if, that, if that's you, speak to me or, or the other fellows who'd like to come on Thursday. We'll see if we can do that. Um, also, uh, a number of the local OP churches have begun having um, quarterly joint evening services. Uh, Emmanuel Belmar, uh, Providence Mantua, Emmanuel West Collingswood, Grace Pennsville, Faith Church Pole Tavern. They've asked us to, to join them. We actually hosted the last one here. We had a great turnout. I mean, the place was just packed. Well, uh, the next one is going to be next Sunday night, and this time it will be hosted at, at, at Faith Church up at Pole Tavern. So hopefully you guys can join. Hopefully we can have a, a, a good, strong contingent, just like they, uh, the other churches in a great group uh, of here. It was really an encouraging. It's so encouraging to have so many people worshiping together, and it's good to, to see each other and catch up and meet some folks from the other churches. Hopefully we'll have a good contingent from here, go up to Faith Church next Sunday night. It's at 6 o'clock, and... Um, Reverend Danny Ollinger is going to be speaking. Danny is the General Secretary of Christian Education for our denomination. He's also kind of a historian, so he's going to be speaking on Machen and the Presbyterian controversy. It's a, it's a sermon. He's going to be preaching from uh, the Gospel of Matthew, but uh, it's Reformation Day weekend, so I think he's going to be relating it to some issues from the founding of our denomination. So it should be a really, really great evening of, of worship together. That's next Sunday night. Um, I want to praise the Lord and rejoice. Uh, Rich and Trish Dugan's son, Son Rich was married this weekend um, to his new bride, Hannah, so we rejoice in that. I want to pray for them as a, as a young couple. And, of course, we want to praise the Lord that Josh Rodriguez is home safe. I understand that, that prior to all the uh, upheaval, uh, Josh really was enjoying his time, his studies, had really good studies there. Uh, um, there in Israel, we're thankful that, that he enjoyed that time. We're also thankful that he made it out safe. Pray for Josh as he uh, adjusts to life back here. He's going to have to do his, his, finish his classes online which is not easy, but pray for him. But we're thankful that he is home safe with us. And also pray for Miranda Caldwell, obviously. Uh, Miranda is, is due uh, soon, <laughs> uh, very soon, I think. And so keep her in your prayers. Plus uh, uh, Allison Grode and, and Evelyn McArdle, Teddy, uh, and, and any others who might be expecting. Just praying for, for peace, uh, for a safe, healthy, happy uh, delivery uh, and, and, and God's grace. So again, I'm thankful um, uh, to be back and we look forward to worshiping together this morning. And in fact, Pastor Church is now going to uh, lead us in our call to worship. Good morning. Well, let's stand to hear these words. Our worship to the King of the Ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever Amen. Hymn number 38, Immortal, Invisible God. 38.
Lord our God, it is our privilege and blessing to stand before you as your people and to acknowledge that you are the only wise and holy God, that you are the Lord. And we thank you, Father, for your grace in our lives that we are here now and not somewhere else. Lord, bless our worship. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, if you will, um, you, you may be seated uh, and turn um, to um, the back of the hymnal. Uh, we're going to read responsively hymn, uh, Psalm 51. Um, it's a great uh, psalm of repentance. And we're going to read it by means of reading it responsibly. I'll read the light print and you can read the dark. It's page 804 if you're looking for, is it up here? Oh. Well, there it is. <laughs> so um, let's, uh, let's hear the word of God from Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my sins, and my sins Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you've crushed rejoice. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your grace. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be right. Amen. Well, Psalm 40, uh, 485, we're going to, by means of um, sort of a hymn of confession, uh, if you'll turn to that hymn for. 85, taken from Psalm 51, and we'll, uh, we'll be uh, singing together hymns 1, 2, 4, and 6. 1, 2, 4, and 6. I'll, I'll hold up fingers.
hear again these words as we've just read them from the psalm, assurance. The Lord says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. A broken and contrite heart God will not despise. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing once more. Uh, 691. It's well with my soul. 691.
that is not overly dramatic. <laughs> that is just the truth of men and women and boys and girls who will lose the weight of their sin and we stand um, forgiven and we stand um, in God's pleasure. So it's a great thing to sing about. Um, be seated, please. <clears throat> um, as we receive um, our tithes and offerings as a means of worship, um, we remember the words of the Apostle Paul who said, just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, uh, in uh, complete earnestness, in your love for us, see that you excel also in this grace of giving. Gentlemen.
Lord our God, we know every good and perfect gift comes from your hand. You and your sovereign grace and love provide everything. And we're thankful to give back a portion for your work, for your glory. Bless it, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. I'll ask you now, if you would, turn with me in your Bible uh, to the book of Revelation. Uh, Revelation chapter 4, uh, verses 1 uh, to 6. And that's page 1,313 in your blue uh, pew Bible. We're working our way together through the book of Revelation. And this morning, we want to consider together the question, what is heaven uh, really like? Again, we're in the book of Revelation. We come this morning to chapter 4. Uh, beginning with verse 1. Let's hear uh, together the word of God uh, to us. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a, a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I'll show you what must take place after this. At once, I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. And around the throne was a, a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and, and rumblings and peals of thunder. And, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a, a sea of glass like crystal. The reading of the word of God. Let's, uh, let's begin in prayer together. Let's pray. Lord in heaven, we do... We pray this morning that you might be pleased to, to lift us up, to raise us up. Take hold of us, Lord, and lift us above our, our, our troubles, our anxieties, our distractions, uh, concerns of the day. And, and, and show us just something, a, a glimpse of the, of the wonders, the joys, the delights, the, the blessings, the pleasures of heaven. Lord, show us something, even, a, even just a, a, a little glimpse of something of your magnificent splendor. And glory, Lord. This, this we add, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, um, well, what is heaven really like? I mean, what do you think? We, we've all heard accounts of people who supposedly died, you know, and, and, and went to heaven and then somehow came back. There, there seems like there's a lot of people who uh, say that over the years. That, and, and some of them claim that, 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 that after they, they died and they, uh, you know, they, they saw a loved one, someone who's previously passed away, a, a grandparent or a parent. And, uh, or others say, well, I, I heard voices or a voice you know, calling me to come up to heaven. Or, or, or sometimes people say, I, I saw a bright light at the end of a tunnel. Or, or sometimes it's kind of a combination of those things. Someone will say, I, I died and I, I was, as I got closer to the bright light, I heard a voice uh, telling me to turn back. It's not your Time yet, or you know, but it, it, it's. I think it's, it's it's worth mentioning that that people all seem to have their own idea, their own conception or preconception of, of what uh, heaven's going to be like. You know, whenever there's a funeral, if the deceased person was an avid golfer, you can almost guarantee somebody somebody's going to say, "I bet right now, Big Ed is up there." On the great golf course in the sky. You know, as if, you know, as if heaven is whatever we want it to be. If, if Ed was not a golfer, if he was an avid fisherman, someone would say, I bet right now Big Ed is up there with his brother Bobby uh, trying to catch a big one. You know, uh, we, we, we often have this idea that heaven is, is whatever I enjoy most or whatever I want it to be. It seems like we all have our own ideas, our theory, our conception, our preconception, uh, good or bad of what heaven is like or what heaven is going to be like. I, I know when I was a kid, the only thing I knew about heaven was what I saw in the comic strips, which is the idea that when you die, you become an angel. I don't know where that comes from, but in the comic strips, when you die, you suddenly sprout wings, and in heaven, you stand around on a cloud. 
I don't know, if you have wings, I don't know why you need to stand around on a cloud. But that was what it's always depicted in the comic strips, that in, in heaven you stand there on a cloud with wings and you play a harp. And, you know, as an eight-year-old boy, you're thinking, man, I hope it's not going to be like that. That sounds terrible. And, and besides, what eight-year-old boy wants to wear a robe, you know, a, a dress, you know. But I think we all have our own idea, right or wrong, good or bad, our, our conception or preconception of what heaven might be like or maybe it's going to be like. But what does the Bible actually say? Uh, this morning we're beginning a new passage, in the book, a new section of the book of Revelation that gives us a vision of what heaven is really like. And it's epic. In fact, it's way more than we can do in just one Sunday. We're going to actually spend weeks on, the, on, the, on this topic. But we've got to begin somewhere. So this morning we want to begin with the observation that in heaven... God reigns in indescribable glory. Okay, look, look with me at our text. Uh, uh, verse 1, John says, after this. Okay, after th okay, remember, John is a prisoner of the Roman government. He's in exile for preaching the gospel. So he's on the island of Patmos. And um, the Holy Spirit came upon him. And he had a, he had a vision, remember? The, the, the resurrected Lord Jesus appeared to John there on the island of, of Patmos. We talked about this last time, which was a couple of weeks ago. That physically, Jesus is, on, is in heaven. And, and yet, spiritually, by the Holy Spirit, he appeared to John uh, on the island of Patmos. We call that the real spiritual presence of, of Christ, that physically Jesus is in heaven, but spiritually he's really here present with his people. So the Holy Spirit, uh, or Jesus, appears to John on the island of Patmos in this vision by the Holy Spirit, and he, and he proceeds to dictate uh, seven letters, one to each of the seven churches of, of Asia. And, and that's kind of recorded for us in what we call the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. But now we begin a, a new portion of the vision, a new portion of this book. John says, after this I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. So John looks and, and, and he sees a door open in heaven. <laughs> if you can imagine, that's pretty, pretty vivid, a door open in heaven. And we've already seen that Jesus alone can open that door. Okay. But back in chapter 3, when Jesus was addressing the, 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 the church in ancient Philadelphia, he says, he says, I have the key of David. I open and no one can shut. And if you remember, the, the Jewish Christians back in that city had been kicked out of the synagogue. The door had been closed shut on them. And yet Jesus said, no, 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 they can't do that. I alone can open up the doors of the kingdom of heaven. I alone open up the doors of heaven. So uh, Jesus alone opens up that door. And if Christ has opened up that door for us, nobody can shut that. Well, John sees a vision of a door open uh, into heaven. And, and he says, and the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet. Now, if you remember back in chapter 1, John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard a voice like a trumpet. And that voice might be Jesus himself. Because John says, I heard a voice like a trumpet, and I turned, and then he sees Jesus. So it, it could be Jesus himself. Maybe this is Jesus himself speaking directly in, in, in this vision. Or perhaps, perhaps it's an angel speaking on behalf of Christ. Because it, it, it makes the point now, repeatedly, he has a voice like a trumpet. And in the book of Revelation, trumpets announce... You know, don't think of uh, Louis Armstrong playing the trumpet. Think of a royal trumpet, you know, dun, da, da. And, and so you can imagine John is in the spirit and, and, and he hears this voice like a trumpet, dun, da, da. And he, he, he turns and he sees the vision of Christ, right? The trumpet voice announces the arrival of, of Jesus Christ the King. And now again he hears a voice like a trumpet. So maybe it's Jesus calling down from heaven saying, John, come on up here. Or maybe it's an angel, a royal ambassador, speaking on behalf of Jesus. But either way, it's, it's Jesus giving the summons. And he says to John, come up here. You know, Jesus is calling, he's inviting, he's summoning John, come on up here in heaven. Jesus alone opens up the door to heaven and he invites you. He summons you. He calls you to come on up and come on in. He says, I, uh, the voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I'll show you what must take place after this. At once, I was in the Spirit. Well, now back in chapter 1, John has already said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And, and now John says, well, after this. And then he says, I, 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 at once I was in the Spirit. It gives the impression that maybe, maybe the book of Revelation is not just one big giant vision. 
Maybe it's several visions. Or at the very least, it's several sections of the same vision. In other words, maybe there was some delay between the vision recorded in chapters 1 to 3. Maybe a few hours passed, a few minutes, a few days even. Maybe, maybe John was given a little bit of rest before, again, the, the Holy Spirit comes upon him and the vision resumes. Well, we don't know, but it's striking. He says, at once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven. In other words, first, John looks and he sees a door open to heaven, and he hears a voice saying, come on up here, I'm going to show you something. And then all of a sudden, whoop, John's up there. All of a sudden, he's going to tell us what he sees in heaven. And it's kind of like when you have a dream. You know, I know some people say that they don't, they don't remember what they dream, but a lot of people, maybe you have a very vivid dream, a dream that's wild, a dream that really makes an impression on you, and you wake up and you think, I've got to tell somebody this. You, know, you wake up your spouse, you won't believe what I dreamed. And so you start telling this, your spouse your dream. I, you know, I was in this house, and there were these people there, and, then, and the next thing I you know, then I'm driving, and your spouse stops you and goes, wait a minute. You were in the house, and now you were in a car. How would you get in the car? And you say, well, you know, it's just a dream. Go with it. Well, this vision is kind of like that. <laughs> One minute, John is down here on the island of Patmos, and he's looking up at this door up in heaven, and the voice is saying, come up here. And the next thing you know, John's the spirit, and he's up there. <laughs> we, we don't really, did, did he, was he literally, physically transported up to heaven? Or is this kind of an out-of-body experience? We really don't know. Um, it's interesting, the apostle Paul apparently had a similar experience that he records in 2 Corinthians 12. Uh, Paul begins by talking about a man that he knew, uh, as if it's somebody else. But, but as Paul proceeds, he, he, he begins, it becomes very clear he's talking about himself. As he talks about how God doesn't want him to be puffed up over it. He, he says, a man in Christ, I knew a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. So Paul had had a similar experience where he had been caught up to the third heaven, whatever that is. And then Paul says, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. So even Paul didn't know, was he physically transported to this place we call heaven? Or was it sort of an out-of-body experience? Paul says, I don't know. I suspect maybe John doesn't know either. Maybe it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But what is significant, the most important thing about heaven, the first thing that we're told, the first thing John sees is a throne. He says, at once I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven. You know, the word throne is a common word. It's a common word in the Bible, but it's actually not very common in the New Testament. If you think about it, um, the most the word throne is used in the New Testament is in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew uses the word five times. That's not that much. Um, the word throne isn't used very much. Okay? Again, the most it's used in the New Testament is in the Gospel of Matthew. It's used five times, except John. And in the book of Revelation, John uses the word throne something like 47 times. <laughs> I mean, in other words, the word throne appears in the book of Revelation more than in all the other books of the New Testament combined. The, the idea of the throne is very important because so often we, we try to be in control. We want to be in control or we fear that somebody else is in control or sometimes we think nobody's in control. My life feels out of control. And one of the purposes of the book of Revelation is to pull back the curtain and to show you that, that somebody is in control. There is a throne, okay? Somebody is in control. And this vision is going to proceed to show us who that is. He says, at once I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. Somebody is in control. Life has meaning. It has purpose. It has direction. The most important thing about heaven is that God is there. Strikingly absent from many people's idea of heaven is God. In, in fact, even in, even in a number of established religions, uh, heaven is simply a place of carnal delight where, where you can do whatever you want, even immoral things. But, but the most important thing about heaven is God. The, the, the heaven is full of the glory of God. Now look what it says. Behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seat on the throne, and he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. Now, jasper and carnelian are, are, are they're precious stones, uh, but, well, 
I'll say this. You remember in the Old Testament, the high priest would wear an ephod, a, a breastplate, when he goes into the Holy of Holies. It had 12 precious stones on it. The first one was jasper. The last one was carnelian. So maybe that's somehow relevant. But the challenge for us is they didn't have precise sort of definitions of these stones. So it's, it's hard for us to know if jasper and carnelian are even the, the accurate translations. Is what they mean by jasper, is that what we think of? Because for us, a jasper stone... It can be green, it can be yellow, even maybe brownish, typically cloudy or, or dull. But later on in the book of Revelation, there's a reference to jasper again, and, it, and it's referred to jasper as being crystal clear, which, which prompts a number of scholars to suspect that maybe the word here for, for jasper uh, is what we would call diamond. <laughs> maybe. The, the description here is of dazzling brilliance, luster, shining. And if that's the case, it certainly fits with other d descriptions uh, of the glory of, of God. In, in 1 Timothy 6, Paul speaks of the blessed and only sovereign. You know, the sovereign is the one on the throne. The blessed and only sovereign, the king of kings and lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. In other words, it's very clear in our text that John does not attempt to describe God the Father as we commonly sometimes think of, an old man with a big white beard. There's no effort to describe him uh, physically. God is a spirit, as the first catechism tells us. He doesn't have a body like men. And so what we have here is not an effort to sort of describe him physically, but rather a hint, a suggestion of the likeness of the appearance of his glory. <laughs> he who sat there had the appearance of jasper or diamond, dazzling, brilliant light, and, and carnelian. Again, we, we just can't be precise about this, but the thought is that carnelian is a, is a precious stone that's, that's deep red, maybe even uh, blood red, uh, which if, if, the, if the jasper or the diamond suggests something of the brilliance, the purity, the holiness, the infinitely pureness of God, the, the, the blood red color uh, might suggest to us that Christ, that God is, is so pure that no evil or wickedness can be tolerated. That he's so pure in his splendor that, that all sin must be, as it were, put to death, punished by by death. We don't know that for sure. It's an image, but these images are meant to be evocative. And certainly uh, these, 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 these precious stones e evoke these thoughts. Um, I, I've mentioned that every book of the Bible builds on the ones that came before. And uh, that's especially true of the book of Revelation. Being the last book of the Bible, it builds on all the other passages that we, we have previously. Uh, but also, each book of the Bible, or many books of the Bible, are different Genres. They're different types of literature. You read poems like the Psalms differently than you're going to read like Paul's letters. Well, the book of Revelation is what we call apocalyptic literature. That is, it uses heightened symbolism. There's a lot of symbolism in parts of the Bible, but apocalyptic literature uses heightened symbol, symbolism and imagery typically to depict or describe for us things of the future and things beyond our experience or our comprehension. So while the book of Revelation builds on all the other books of the Bible, it especially builds on, on those parts of the Bible that also use apocalyptic imagery. So, for example, portions of Daniel, portions of Zechariah or Zephaniah, and portions of the book of Ezekiel. In this case, the imagery is very similar to the imagery you used in a vision uh, that, that the prophet Ezekiel has. And I'm just going to read this to you really quickly. In the book of Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel says... Uh, there was a likeness of a throne. <laughs> he doesn't even say a throne. Again, it's, there was a, a likeness of a throne in, in appearance uh, like sapphire. Uh, and, and seated above the likeness of a throne was a, a likeness with a, a human appearance. You know, he, he's struggling to describe because in some ways God is unlike any other. There is no perfect comparison. And, and, and he's trying to describe, and Ezekiel says, such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. In other words, he doesn't say, I saw God. <laughs> Ezekiel's a prophet. And yet he doesn't say, I saw God. Such was the appearance of God. Such was the, li such was the appearance of the likeness 
uh, of the glory of God. As if to say, all I'm getting is a glimpse of a glimpse, a, a hint of something of the glory and the splendor. I can't see God, but I, I saw something, just a little bit, a, a glimpse of the appearance, the likeness of the glory. And, and even that is just, it's, it's beyond our comprehension. Uh, the glory of God far exceeds anything we've ever seen or, or can imagine. I, I mean, he goes on to say, he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow. Well, how do you have a rainbow around the throne? I mean, I can picture a rainbow over the throne, but how do you have a rainbow around the throne? And, and he says, around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Well, I mean, I think a rainbow by definition is multicolored. An emerald's green. How do you have a multicolored green rainbow? I, you know, we, I don't think we can picture that. But we do know the rainbow is a sign of God's covenant you know, to Noah that he would never again flood the earth. And so perhaps the image here is God in his brilliant radiance, infinite purity and holiness, such that no evil can be tolerated and, and, and must result in, in death. And yet, here's a rainbow. That for the believer, God has calmed the storm. That he has made peace with us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. I, I think at least a hint here is that the glory of God far exceeds anything we can, we've ever seen. Um, again, when Ezekiel had his vision, he said, Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I, I fell on my face. <laughs> Ezekiel doesn't even claim to see God. He's, he claims to see an appearance of the likeness of God's glory. And even that is just so overwhelming. Ezekiel just falls down and, and, and he worships. I, I think the idea is that the glory of God is so far beyond anything we've ever seen or, or can imagine. Again, when Paul describes his experience, he says that when he was taken up to heaven, he heard things that cannot be told, which man... <laughs> Um, may not utter. Now, I mentioned at the beginning, you know, it seems like a lot of people uh, these days claim to have died and, and, and gone to heaven and somehow come back, and they all have their story to tell. I think it's, it's I, well, first of all, it's not my place to sit down up here and try to judge other people's spiritual experiences. I, but I think it's at least noteworthy that these visions of heaven, even among the prophets, were exceedingly rare. Even among the, the prophets of the Old Testament, even among the, the apostles, these sort of visions are, are exceedingly rare. Uh, we should at least make us stop and think. And, and, and secondly, when, when Paul is taken up to the third heaven, he says that uh, he saw things that, that cannot be told. The, the man may not utter them. Maybe what he's saying is, I just can't, I can't put it into words. Or maybe he's saying, it's not appropriate for me to say you know, Paul's an apostle. His whole calling, his job is to preach and to tell people on behalf of Jesus. And yet when he's taken up to heaven, he sees things that he's either not able or not allowed to say. So it should at least make us cautious. That's all. Cautious when we hear accounts of people who say they've been to heaven and come back and tell us what they've seen. Not to say that people are deliberately lying either. I, I don't want to get into all of that. Um, but I think, I think it's, it's, it's noteworthy when... Paul describes his experience. He speaks of the, the surpassing greatness of the revelations. I do think this. I think if somehow you could die, see something of the glory of God, and come back. If you could see something of the glory of God in heaven, it would be awful hard to come back here. We all, I mean, you know, you think about when the Apostle Paul was, was, in, it was in prison and he writes to the Philippians and he's awaiting his, his, his trial. And Paul knows either he's going to be put to death or he's going to be set free. Those are the only two options. And, and, and Paul says, well, most of us, wouldn't we, we want to go free. Paul says, well, my desire is to go and be with Christ. <laughs> That's better by far. I think to, to see something of the glory and the majesty and the splendor of God in heaven would make it awful, awful, awful hard to come back down, to see that and then come back down, down here. Um, well, 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 the point then is that uh, God is infinitely glorious and he's the one on the throne. He's the one in charge. It, sometimes, again, we feel like life is out of control, that, that somebody's abandoned the, the, the ship, that, that nobody's behind the wheel, and yet here's this reassurance that in heaven, God rules. 
He reigns, and he reigns in indescribable glory. Psalm 99 says, the Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. In other words, let all that we know and trust in, anything that seems solid like the, the ground beneath our feet, let it all fall away because the Lord is on the throne. A Psalm 104, oh Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment. You, know, you dwell in unapproachable light. This God in heaven reigns in indescribable glory, and in some sense in Christ, we reign with him. Uh, this is what our text says. Now, picking up with verse 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And if you remember, again, back, back in chapter 3, when Jesus was dictating a letter to the church in Laodicea, he said, to the one who conquers, I'll grant him to sit with me on my throne. And we talked about that at the time, that sometimes in the ancient world, there were thrones large enough to seat more than one person, like a love seat. So maybe the imagery is Jesus saying, you overcome, you'll sit right here next to me. But we also said that often the term throne is kind of a collective noun. It doesn't, it doesn't always necessarily refer to just that chair, but, but the rule, you know, that... that in a, in a palace, there might be a, a, a throne for the king and one for the queen and one for a prince and one for a princess. And collectively, it might be just referred to as the throne. And that seems to be the image here because there is the throne in the center. But then around that, 24 thrones. And, and seated on the thrones were, were 24 elders. Well, in scripture, elders represent the people of God. Like, like in our country, we believe in a representative government. That, you know, we elect our leaders and their job is to represent us, represent our cares and our concerns and our needs. Well, that's a biblical concept. In the Bible, it's the elder's job is to represent the people. Here we see 24 elders representing us, representing God's people, seated on the throne there uh, with the Father. Um, in, in, the, in the book of Revelation, uh, numbers are typically symbolic as opposed to uh, stati what they call stati statistical numbers are numbers that you add and you, su you subtract. Um, if you're balancing your checkbook, that's a statistical number. Symbolic numbers are, have a symbolic reference. If I said to you, meet me here tomorrow at 0800 hours, I'm not asking you to pull out your calculator and calculate uh, 800 hours from now. No, 0800 is symbolic, it means 8 o'clock. In the same way, in the book of Revelation, numbers are typically uh, a symbolic. 24 thrones with 24 elders, well, probably represents all the people of God. From the 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament and the, and the 12 apostles of the New, you know, they're representing us. I think the idea is that all of God's people will be there in glory. You know, Jesus makes that point when he says, many will come from north and south, east and west, to sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So here's the patriarchs from of old. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But then people coming from north and south and east, from all over the world, from different countries and different cultures and different, different languages and um, throughout all the different ages and, and eras. And, you know, if the Lord tarries, um, that would include not just believers, loved ones, Christians from the past, but also eventually uh, from the future. I mean, you know, we often think, well, I'll go to heaven, I'll, I'll see my, my, my Christian grandmother. And, and, and Sure, but, you know, it's not like heaven stops when you get there. And so at least at some point, if the Lord tarries, then you, you may well see uh, Christian grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Great, 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 great nieces and, and nephews. You know, I, I've known people who were, who were dying. They said, my biggest regret is I won't live to see my grandchild being born. Oh, but it doesn't mean you won't see her again. You know, if you think about it, if, if the Lord tarries, we'll be there in, in glory with all God's people, past, present, and, 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 and at some point from the future as, as well. Um, nobody will be missing. The idea of the 24 elders, all of God's people are, are represented. And in a sense, this exaltation has already happened. Remember, Paul told the Colossians, you've been raised with Christ. You know, you're already raised up there with him at the right hand of God. Uh, Jesus, even now, grants us to sit with him upon the throne. Uh, Paul told the Ephesians, even, even when we were dead in our trespasses, even when there was no spiritual life in us, 
God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. In other words, it's completely a gift. It's completely free. It's not dependent at all on our actions, our behavior, our religiosity. By grace you've been saved. And you've been raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ. So in a sense, this has already begun. Maybe not completely fulfilled, but it's already enacted. It's, it's, in some sense, we're already seated on the thrones with him. Jesus grants us to sit with him on his throne. And he gives us uh, white garments to wear. It says, around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments. As Christians, we can be very full of ourselves, certainly. But I think the more we grow, and the more we get a, a glimpse of the splendor, and the majesty, and the purity, and the holiness, and the, the, the greatness of God's glory, and the glory of his greatness, you know, the more we see it, the more we come to recognize something of our stain and our shame and our impurity and our sinfulness. It, like, like when you, like you go into a, um, a store at the mall with one of your kids to buy your son some new sneakers. You're, you're there for him. You, know, you think my shoes are fine. And you get, but then you see these sneakers on the wall and they're so white. And then you look down at your own shoes. You're like, oh my goodness, did I did I get these out of the trash? You know, you know in, the, in these stores that with that harsh fluorescent lighting and all the mirrors and everything, oh, you thought you were fine, but all of a sudden, you, you look like a homeless person. You look, your, your clothes look faded out and, and, and wrinkled and, and you look washed out. And you, as we see more and more of the, of the glory and the majesty and the beauty and the grandeur of, of God, we instinctively, we see more and more of our own corruption and we want to be covered up. And we want to uh, hear Jesus offers you white robes, pure robes, forgiveness, the righteousness of Christ. The elders on the throne are all dressed in, in white robes. Remember, uh, Jesus said this to the church in, in, in Laodicea. He says, I counsel you to, to buy from me gold refined by fire. Without money, come and buy from me. He says, gold uh, refined by fire and white garments to clothe yourself. Jesus grants us to sit with him on his throne. To, 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 he gives us white garments to wear and he, and he puts a crown upon our head. It says around the throne were 24 thrones and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. Well, the imagery here is royal, right? They're on thrones. And yet the word crown there is not the crown, the word there typically for a royal crown, but, but for a wreath, the kind of crown that was rewarded when you successfully completed an athletic uh, competition. You know, they didn't give you a, a blue ribbon or a, um, a gold medal, but a, but a wreath. If you, if you remember, the Apostle Paul says that I've, I've run the race. I've run the race, and now there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to, to me, but also to all those who've, who've loved disappearing. I think sometimes people are running the wrong race. We're running the, the rat race. If, if, if the race is to please everybody or impress everybody or, or to accumulate the, the, best, the most stuff, Paul didn't finish the race. Because he, 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 he was very unpopular in a lot of ways. He, he, he had nothing to speak of. If that's the race, uh, Paul, Paul, he didn't finish the race. He, he failed. He certainly didn't, didn't win. But that's not the race. In, in the Bible, the, the Christian race is, is, the, is, the, is the fight of faith. It's, it's the race to, to keep your eyes on the Lord and, and look forward to, to, to Jesus coming back even when the money isn't flowing. Even when it's not the popular thing to do. Even when, even when things aren't going the way. That's the race. <laughs> to keep trusting. To keep, to keep looking. Even when, man, I, I, don't feel like, I don't feel like this is good at all. Um, Jesus puts that crown of righteousness on your head. Now, uh, it's not to suggest that somehow we're, we're equal with Christ. You know, Christ is on the throne. God's on the throne. And so are we. Rather, it's the opposite. We're obviously not equal with Christ. But... But it's, it's grace. That's the whole point. Is that by God's grace, we're, we're allowed to go where we absolutely don't belong. We're given this vision of how incredibly splendid and wonderful and glorious it is. And then, and then there we are up there with them. It's, it's grace. We obviously aren't equal with Christ, but, but we're exalted with him. It's, it's God's grace raised up with Christ, exalted with Christ. Now, verse 5. And from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings 
and peals of thunder, reminiscent of that scene when, when the Lord descended on Mount Sinai with the, the cloud of thick darkness and, and smoke, and, and remember the, the mountain shook, and there was lightning and, and thunder, and it was, it was as if the, the earth could not contain the glory of God, that, that as, as God drew near to his creation, as it were, the supernatural weather phenomenon began to occur. It's, it's just the world cannot contain uh, his, his glory. Well, there's that uh, reminiscent of that same imagery. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. Well, remember again, numbers in the book of Revelation typically are, are symbolic. And for the Jewish people, the, the number seven was especially important because it represented wholeness or, or completion. It's like if someone said, I've sailed the seven seas. It means they've, they've been everywhere. They've done it all. Okay, seven days of the week. In fact, the, the number seven is symbolically so important in, in all the, the different Old Testament, the Jewish festivals and so on. Some have even suggested the number seven speaks to the essence of reality. That this, this one day in seven is, is just impressed into the, the essence of creation. But here, there are seven torches of fire that represent the seven spirits of God. Well, we've already seen something, an image of the likeness, the appearance of the glory of God, that God the Father on the throne. And next time we'll see the, the lamb who was slain, who lives again, obviously representing for us Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. But here we have seven torches of fire uh, representing the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Lord dwells in heaven in all the fullness of his triune glory. It's, it's another thing that, that should make us cautious uh, when we hear people uh, too quickly talk about what they think heaven is like. Uh, remarkably uh, missing, not only from people's view of heaven, but from their religion, is any kind of understanding that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is and has revealed himself to be triune. And in heaven he dwells in all his triune glory, including all the fullness of his spirit. And all is clear and laid bare uh, before the Lord. Uh, verse 6. We'll, we'll end with this. It says, And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass. Well, the, the, the sea could represent any number of things. It could represent simply our, our distance, you know, from God. He's not just one of us. In, in Ezekiel's vision, there's a vision of something like the appearance of the glory of God and then a sea between him and us. So maybe that represents his, God's otherness, the, what we call the creator-creature distinction. Um, others have suggested, remember, and we'll, we'll see this more in weeks to come, that the temple was designed as a reflection of, of heaven. So what we have really is a worship scene here. And in the temple, there was a basin uh, that was used for, for washing, for cleansing. So some have suggested that the sea here represents the cleansing we have in Christ. I don't, I don't think that's as likely. Uh, but I think most likely, and we'll see this imagery, we, saw it, we see it in Daniel, we'll see it again in the book of Revelation, is that for people in the ancient world, the sea was a place of uh, chaos, <laughs> It, it, it wasn't safe. I mean, the, 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 it, was, it was scary to go out there on the sea, the winds and, 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 and the waves. And, and here we see a sea of glass. Well, whatever you think of glass, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't move around. It doesn't, it, it doesn't shift. It doesn't, it does, it's, it's set. And so what we see here, we'll, we'll see this more clearly in, in weeks to come, is that the book of Revelation does not just give us a vision of heaven. It gives us a vision of everything. It gives us a vision of all creation uh, from the perspective of heaven. And so while we, we live down here in, in the world of flux, where everything is changing and we're always waiting for that next shoe to drop, the picture seems to be, yet from God's perspective, the sea is stilled. <laughs> it's a sea of, of glass. God's plans are, are set. And not only that, it says it was a sea of glass like crystal. In the ancient world, glass was murky. It was, it was dark. It was different than stone or wood. It did allow some light in, but it was, it was dark and cloudy. And, and what we think of as clear glass was very, very rare and, uh, and very, very expensive. But here is a sea of glass like crystal. The idea that the sea is, is clear. One of the, 
think the difficulties of our lives, we just don't know what's going to happen next. We never know. And I think we often live in fear, of not just of what's going to happen or what might happen, but we live in the fear of the fact that I won't be able to handle it when it comes. Because sometimes even logically, even logically we know, well, if that happens, I know logically it's, it's okay. But I also know myself and I know I'll panic and I'll freak out and I'll worry. And I, we live in fear not just of what might happen, but how I won't be able to handle it. Um, but here from the perspective of heaven, huh, it's all laid bare, you know. Um, all is clear and laid bare before the Lord. Everything makes sense in God's plan. I can't see it from down here. You know, we often wonder, why is God doing this? Why is God, you know, but maybe in some sense we don't need to know. We just need to know that somebody's in charge, <laughs> that there is a purpose, and the one on the throne is not just good, but infinitely glorious. And I, and I guess we'll, we'll end with that this morning, that, that our passage doesn't really give us application. We will get some application as we get it deeper into Revelation, but our passage doesn't really give us application, but the Apostle Paul does, commenting on these same things. He says that these things are true. If you're seated with Christ in the heavenly places, then seek those things that are above. Uh, set your mind on those things. Seek the things of God and, and set your mind on the, on the things of heaven. Um, one thing, remember, if you remember the voice that spoke like a trumpet that says to John, come up here, I'm going to show you the things that are going to happen. Okay, those things are not very good. <laughs> At least they're not very pleasant. Uh, the Jewish people had anticipated that when the Messiah came, everything would instantly be good. The Romans would be dealt with and life would be perfect. And that just didn't happen. And even those who were, who were believers, who were Christians, well, they, just, they, they tended to think, at least many of them, Jesus will come back very, very soon. This is temporary. Christians in Thessalonica, remember, weren't even working because they were just so certain Jesus would come back any minute now. And one thing they were going to see is that revealed is that Life is going to go on, <laughs> much as it always had. There, there's going to continue to be struggle and, and war and pestilence and disease and death and, 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 and persecution and all these things that they did not anticipate would be part of the Messianic kingdom. And how do you prepare for stuff like that? I, I think sometimes we fear, you know, that, that, that you can be so heavenly minded you're not of any earthly good. And, and certainly Proverbs says that a wise person sees danger coming and takes refuge, you know. Uh, but you can't always anticipate what's going to happen. And even when you do, even when you see it coming, you can't always prevent it. And often there's nothing you can really do to prepare yourself. I think, I think perhaps the best thing you can do to, uh, to prepare yourself for, for the future is to have something of the, of the, of the glimpse of the, of the greatness of the, of the glory of God. <laughs> You know, something whose glory far outshines all the baubles and things that tempt us down here. Something that, that, that far outweighs all of our, our, our trouble. I mean, what better way to prepare for the unknown, for the worst of the world, as we fear the worst? Well, suppose the worst does happen. What can prepare, what can carry you through the worst, the worst, if it's not this wonderful, glorious God? And so I, I, th I, think, uh, I think, if nothing else, this vision of something of the likeness, the appearance, the glory of God is, is given to, to give us something bigger. Bigger than our troubles, bigger than our sin, our woes, our, our problems. Uh, to, to encourage us to s seek the things of, of God and, and set your mind on things of heaven. To, to, to understand that in heaven, God reigns in indescribable glory. And in some sense, in Christ, we we reign with him. Oh, let's pray together. Father in heaven, you are beyond glory, beyond magnificent, beyond splendid. We, we confess, we bemoan, we renounce our, our, our lesser thoughts of, of you and all the foolishness and sin that comes with that. And, and, and Lord, we pray that you would increasingly open the eyes of our heart and give us something, a, a, a taste of a taste, uh, we, some grander idea of just how magnificent and wonderful and glorious you are, that we might, our hearts might be set at rest to know that you are in control, that you have good, there are good purposes behind our troubles and our, and our trials. Lord, help us to set our heart on, on you and to seek those things 
of you. Lord, we ask your, your blessing, your grace. You might increasingly show yourself to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you would, uh, turn with me in your hymnal to our, our closing hymn. A hymn we haven't, uh, we haven't sung in a while, but I think it's very, very appropriate. It's hymn, I see, I think it's 549. 549, let's stand. We'll sing together, By the Sea of Crystal. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.